copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 106. Stand by to assist Captain Cato and Nick Harris on the special assignment. That's all. Rolls and quits. <laughs> declares war on bootleg gasoline. Hot price wars in the gasoline industry have created many chips brands for the cheapest gasoline carelessly produced in crude bootleg steel. Low prices attract many motorists who don't realize the damage done to their motors by such carbon-laden mixtures. Because Rio Grande's sensational patented cracking process has made cracked gasoline a leader among the quality gasoline, Rio Grande assumes leadership in the oil industry's war on poor quality gasoline. Rio Grande refinery experts have purchased an entirely new gasoline to sell at a lower price, that it is guaranteed to exceed the United States government standards and specifications for safe motor fuel. And because Rio Grande cracked gasoline is famous for its use in more police cars, fire engines, and other emergency equipment than any other brand, we decided to name our new gasoline after the famous G-Men who came to the aid of the police to stop bootlegging. We asked those of you who use low-price gasoline to try Rio Grande G-Gas. Make no mistake, this new G-Gas is not cracked. Rio Grande cracked gasoline for very little more per gallon using 100% efficiency. Police car performance, set for echo, and much greater value. But if your budget won't stand the extra pennies for superlative performance, then be a G-Man. Get the finest gasoline made in the low-price field. Rio Grande G-Gas. The low-price gasoline that's guaranteed to achieve government specifications. Pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. You have heard me emphasize many times on these broadcasts the necessity for closer cooperation between various law enforcement agencies of the nation, state, county, and municipalities. Very often, representatives of several or all of these forces meet in the investigation of a major crime. And unfortunately, more often than not, there is friction where there should be the smoothest cooperation. I have here in the studio with me tonight a man who, I am happy to say, has always worked with the closest kind of cooperation with my force. I consider him not only a close friend, but a very valuable auxiliary. When I know that Miss Harris has been brought into a case, I know that my men will have the finest kind of cooperation. Friends, it is a privilege for me to present one of the finest private detectives in the world, Nick Harris, who has opened his private files to bring you tonight's broadcast of calling all cars. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Harris. Thanks, Steve. And I could say a lot of nice things about you, too. And good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to participate in the fine work this broadcast is doing. During the many years I've been a detective, I have constantly carried on what might be called missionary work in my attempt to educate the public to the fact that crime does not pay. For this reason, I have watched with interest Splendid work calling all cars has been doing for the past two years along these same lines. I was more than pleased to cooperate when I was asked if I had some material we might use for these broadcasts. 
story we selected to dramatize tonight is a strange one. The sort of a story you might expect from the pen of an Edgar Allan Poe or a Conan Doyle. Yet it all happened, just as you will hear. Had the mastermind of this criminal been employed upon a more legitimate enterprise, he might have made himself many times the fortune he hoped to gain by his illegal activity. But criminals are funny that way. They never seem to learn that apparently the easy way of the lawbreaker is inevitably the hardest way. We, who every day see the fallacy of the criminal psychology, can only hope that through our educational activity, those who may be contemplating a crime may be deterred before it's too late by the realization of the idiocy of breaking the law. Our story begins on an August morning, several years ago, when I received a telephone call from Wesley Barnes to the editor of the Los Angeles Evening Herald. West was somewhat excited. He told me he had a mystery for me to solve and asked me to hurry over to the city room. Fifteen minutes after he called me, I was standing beside his desk. Well, Wes, what's on your mind? This note came in this morning's mail. Eh? What's it say? Listen, it's addressed to the city editor, and it reads, If you will go to the Westlake District, you will find a man named Gavro. When you find him, you will have the mastermind burglar. I am writing this to save some mother's innocent son. And it's signed, A Friend of Humanity. Well, what do you think about it? Maybe it's a publicity stunt some Hollywood press agent is pulling, and maybe it's on the up and up. Well, I've got a hunch it's on the level. Well, if it's a publicity gag, I don't want to be the goat. And if it's legitimate, it's a matter for the police. So I thought I'd better send you out and get the lowdown. Okay, Wes. Only listen. If it turns out to be the real McCoy, you're giving me a scoop on it. Don't worry, Wes. You'll get it. Exclusive. So, Nick Harris details a couple of men to investigate the hotels and apartment houses in the West Lake District for a man named Gavreau. The officers play in luck. For the fifth place visited, they locate their man. An hour later, they are reporting to their chief. We found a fellow by the name of Gavreau, registered the El Capitan apartment in West Six. First name is George. Mm-hmm. What would you find out about him? Well, not much, but enough to sound suspicious. Yeah, the manager of the El Capitan says he's a queer one. What do you mean by that? Well, he comes here and goes out at the same time. Nobody knows anything about him. He keeps to himself all the time. Well, sounds worth following up. You two boys go out there and shadow that bird. Find out where he spends his time and why. Okay, Keith. Watching their man whenever he leaves his apartment, the shadows soon discover that he makes daily visits to a trunk factory on Main Street. They interview the manager of the establishment. Yes, gentlemen, what can I do for you? You know a man by the name of Gavreau? George Gavreau? Yes, indeed. He's a customer of mine. What do you know about him? Oh, nothing much. Why do you ask? We're officers doing a little job of investigation. We want to find out something about the man. Mm. We'd appreciate your help. Well, of course, I'm always glad to help the law. Well, all right, then. What do you know about this law? Well, as I said, I really don't know very much. I'm making a trunk for him. You know why? I think the guy is a nut. What do you mean? Well, he wants a trunk that's padded inside and has a small seat in it. What? Yes, and it's to have a false top that can be opened from the inside after the trunk has been locked. Now, what the devil's all that for? <laughs> he says he's going to do a whole guinea act on the stage. I tell you, I think he's gaffing. <laughs> Sure enough, sounds daffy to me. But don't forget that note that banded him as a mastermind burglar. <laughs> I'm beginning to like the looks of this case. But it doesn't make any sense to you. That's why I'm beginning to like it. I think maybe there is something here. When they start making no sense, you're just around the corner from the answer. Now, you boys go on out that guy's tail and don't lose sight of him. Day or night, they may be surprised what they find out about him. <laughs> Followed him upstairs. He went into room 12. Had a key to it. Now, what do you suppose that guy's up to? For the swell apartment on the El Capitan, 
And a room in a dump like this out on South Flower Street. Oh, well, we better see what the landlady knows about it. Okay. And here's her apartment around here. Uh, apartment around here. Uh, Tenant here by the name of Gabro. Yes. He's in number twelve, isn't he? Yes. What do you know about him? Who wants to know? Well, now let's not get in an argument, lady. We're merely asking some questions. Hey, you look like cops to me. Well, even if we are, we won't get you into any trouble. Well, can I depend on that? You can. Well, I I don't know nothing about Mister Gabro, excepting that he pays his rent in advance and. He hasn't slept in his bed since he took the room. Oh, hasn't slept in his bed, eh? Oh, that don't bother me none. If you don't sleep in it, I don't have to make it. How long has he had the room? Oh, about ten days. Can I look here? I don't want you to go make no trouble for him. If all my room is as quiet as here, I like to be Well, looks to me, boys, as though that Fire Street spot is our friend's hideout and center of operations. I'm beginning to agree with you, Chief. It makes so little sense, there must be something to it. Well, we'll find out soon enough. You go, go back there, rent the room next to his, install a dictograph in it, and stake out on him. I'll put another man on the outside to shadow him whenever he leaves the place. Okay, Chief. With a man constantly at the dictograph, and another constantly shadowing Gavro when he leaves the rooming house, the suspect is always under Miss Harris' surveillance. A few days later, Gavro was seen scraping up an acquaintance with a boy about 19 in Westlake Park. He was followed to the Flower Street room, and once certain that Gavreau had gone to his room, the Harris operative joined his partner at the dictograph. He just came in. Yeah, I know it. I've been telling him. He took a young kid over in the park there, both in there now. Put on those earphones and see what they're saying. I couldn't get close enough to him in the park. Quiet. Something big, the 
two officers report their findings to Nick Harris, expecting to get the order to make an arrest once. But Harris, knowing that if you arrest Gavro at this point, he will have no case. No overt action has been committed. Orders the two men to return to the uh, plant and await the development. This they do, and three days later, they're taken to the border. They overhear the following conversation. Kid, we're ready to try the trunk out. Well, we've got a bank all lined up. Tomorrow I want you to make arrangements to have the trunk placed in the vault next Friday. It'll give us two days. Then I want you to get the trunk out of there on the pretense that you decided to go away and you're taking the trunk with you. Do you understand that? Yeah, I got it. From the time I'm sealed up in there until I get out again, it's all up to you. You think you can handle it? Yeah, I'm sure of it. Good. Now... Does that mean you go and see the people at the bank? Tell them that you have valuables worth a lot of money in this house. Then, when that's done, there's nothing left for you. And that's the story, Mr. Wanger. But it's the most fantastic scheme I've ever heard, Mr. Harris. It's, it's incredible. You know, as it may, it's true. Now, I want to ask your cooperation in this matter. I want you to let the boy have the trunk moved into your vault. But, Mr. Harris, do you realize the chance I take by doing that? Suppose something goes wrong and this plan of theirs works. Why, the bank has valuable stored in those vaults worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. I assure you that nothing will go wrong, Mr. Wanger. I'll have men posted here in the bank. I'll be here myself. There isn't a possible chance of anything happening to your valuable. You realize that if news of this thing leaked out to my depositors, I, I'd be ruined. No one would leave their belongings in the bank for such things happen. I don't feel at all right about this, Mr. Harris. Mm-hmm. Naturally, I understand your feelings. But I can't see how you fail to realize the importance of this thing. I want to catch the criminal red-handed. This way, I can. Well, there's something I don't think you know about our walk, Mr. Harris. Every night, in order to protect the furs and things down there, we spray a chemical solution into the vault that is powerful enough to kill a man. If this criminal ever does get in, he won't be alive in the morning. Mm. It puts a different light on things, doesn't it? Well, if you want your man alive, it does. All right. I'll tell you what. If you'll allow the trunk to be put in there, I'll make an arrest before you close the vault. How's that? Well, I suppose that would be all right. That way, there'll be no danger of anything happening to your deposits, and I'll still have my man in the case against you. Do you agree to that? All right, Mr. Harris, I will. Good. All you have to do is to act as though you suspected nothing. I'll take care of the rest. Uh, uh... The very next day, Gavreau suddenly changes his plan. Instead of a bank, he informs his assistant that he has selected the Cinema Land Storage Company for the robbery. That he has set the date for that week. That he has set the date for that week. Reporting at once to their chief, and then plan a new strategy. Did Gavreau give any reason for his sudden change in plans? He told the kid that on account of a lot of the screen stars being robbed lately, they told Gavreau give any reason for his sudden change in plans? He told the kid that on account of a lot of the screen stars being robbed lately, they put all their stuff in this storage place. There were a lot better chickens there than in the bank. I see. Well, this changes our plans a little, but not seriously. You got to let them get into the storage warehouse, Chief? Oh, I am. Then a few of us will pick up the boy, go into the building, and wait for our friend to make an appearance out of his magic trunk. Huh. Won't he be surprised when he sees us? I rather imagine he will. Not too happily surprised. <laughs> I'd sure like to get a look at the inside of that trunk. Now I'd better go out and see the manager of the Cinema Land Storage Company and tell him about it. Oh, uh, you want us to stay with the dictograph sheet? Right. And if our genius makes another change of plan, let me know at once. Well, don't worry, we will. And I hope he doesn't. I'd kind of like to finish this thing up. Cheer up, boys. We should have Gavreau behind bars before the week is out. It's unbelievable, that's what it is. Like a storybook. Not quite as harmless as a storybook, but certainly a strange scheme. Well, what is it you want me to do? Well... I'm not just sure of what day they'll bring the trunk in, but I'll have men stationed outside watching your place all the time. All you have to do is to act as though everything is all right. Have the trunk moved into the warehouse and let my men take care of the rest. And you're sure there won't be any slip up? Absolutely. You needn't have a single fear. Well, all right. But I'll be very fixed someplace else instead of here. 
gives the fellow the creep knowing that bandits were around. Uh, how to know it's the right... Uh, how to know it's the right trunk. I'll let you know. Now, don't worry about that. I'm hmm, kind of nervous about it, but well, I guess it's okay. I'm sure you'll do it that way. Thanks a lot. Don't worry. <laughs> The plans are carefully laid. An inescapable net is thrown around the Cinema Land storage building. A dozen terrace operators are placed in strategic spots in the neighborhood. From the second story of a small building across the street, two men watch night and day. From the cab of a milk wagon parked down the street, two more men seem to be on loading and unloading crates of milk, keep an alert eye on all passers by. Meanwhile, in the office of Nick Harris. Nick? If you let this story leak out to a rival journal, I'll nail your skin to a fence. Don't forget that you promised me a soup on it. I'm not forgetting, Wes. I can't give you anything more than I already have until they make a move. When they do, you're in on it. Yes? Oh, all right, send them in. What's up? Nothing to do your rag any good, you old news host. Just Herman Klein and Ed Cato from Central. I sent for them. Well, I guess I might as well leave you to talk to them. Let me know when things begin popping. Come in. Oh, hello, boys. Hey. You know Wes Barr, don't you? Sure. How are you, Herman? Ed? Oh, hello, Wes. Might know we'd find you here if there was something breaking. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, boys. I thought you might be interested to know that we expect our little trunk genius to pull his act any minute now. Good. I was going to think maybe he's been running up the wrong alley or something. <laughs> no. We're in the right alley. It's just been a matter of waiting. But it looks as though we're just about to go, finally. Uh, yes? I've heard of one place, Chief. Your bro has just locked himself in the trunk. You're the supervisor of loading. You're going to the truck now. Good. Stay with that trunk. Don't lose it no matter what happens. I'll head to the storage building at once. Right. Well, that's what we've been waiting for, boys. How about it, Wes? You still leaving, or do you want to go along? What a question to ask me. Come on. Picking up a newspaper cameraman on the way, Hubbard, Cato, Klein, and Barr roll out Sunset Boulevard to the warehouse. A block from the destination, they see a delivery truck pull up to the entrance of the building. Two men jump out and let down the back seat. Better choose by and get a good look at him, Herman. When you get to the other corner, pull around at some park. I'll see you. Okay, Herman. Swing around here and stop. Bar, you and I had better cut across this lot. Mm-hmm. Herman, you and Cato walk up the other side of the street. We'll let him get the trunk inside and pick up the kids. The other side. Herman, you and Cato walk up the other side of the street. We'll let him get the trunk inside and pick up the kid. Okay, Nick. Come on, Ed. The kid. Okay, Nick. Come on, Ed. Come on, Ed. Okay, Nick. Come on, Ed.
the street. Quiet. Pardon me, buddy. What's your name? Huh? What's that? What's your name? Um, Ed Silver. What's in that front? What's it to you? Maybe look at that. Okay, that's right. Now, how about it? What's in that front? Why, it's some clothes. Look here, Silver. This isn't going to do you any good. You told the people in that warehouse you had oil samples in that trunk, didn't you? Well, yes, I guess. Yes, I guess. I guess I did. Now it's... Yes, I... I guess I did. Now it's closed, I eh, kid? I don't know. Closed, I eh, kid? I don't know. How long are you going to leave George in that trunk, Silver? Why? Oh, I... I knew something would happen. I knew something would happen. All right, kid. We know all about it. You go up and see George? Well, I... I guess I wasn't cut off to be a successful burglar. I... I had a feeling something was going to go wrong. Come on, kid. Let's go up, boys. Well, you got him, huh? Yes. Trunk's up on the boss. You want to go up there now? That's right. Uh, the elevator's right over here. Don't start things till I get my camera set up, will you, boy? Oh, I wouldn't think of it. This is going to be something worth photographing. This way, through this whole door here. Hmm. Some door of that. Looks like a bank. Looks like a bank. <laughs> it is a bank. At least, the board itself. Absolutely burglary. Yeah, we can see that it is. There's the trunk. All right, Mac. Get your cameras up. Okay. All ready? Let it go. All right, Gavro. You might as well come out of there. He's going to play possum. Come on, George. Open up. Are you coming out, or we, do we bust this trunk to bits and pull you out? Maybe he's smothered to death. I don't think so. Gavro? I'll give you just one more chance to do your Houdini and come out of there. If you don't, we're going to smash that trunk to bits and you with it. Look, there's a whole piece of the trunk lifting up. Come on out, Gabriel, and keep your hands in sight. Don't shoot! No, we're not shooting, Gabriel. That is a flashlight picture. Now stay where you are and you won't get hurt. When you look at that trunk, it's falling all apart. Put the cuffs on him, boys. Right. Come on, Houdini. Here's something for you to play with. See what you can do with them. How'd you know I was in here? We've known all about you for quite a while, Gavro. But how? No one knew but the kid and I. No one tell you all about it when we get to the station, George. And they got you too, kid. Yeah. They got me. Oh, that's too bad. I still don't see why it didn't work. All right, Herman. Suppose you and Ed break them down and book them while we look through this trunk. I'm going to make a thorough examination of it. Right. Come on, you two. We'll take a little lie. I can't see why it didn't work. Oh, you're looking at this pair of an angel wet. Cards to pass the time away, bandages and iodine in case of injury, a complete set of burglary tools, what, food, water, what? This is practically a completely funny house. Did you get a picture of all this, man? Sure, didn't you see that guy knock the front of pieces when I set that flash powder off? That's right. I'd almost forgotten it in the excitement. That was what scared Gavroso. He thought he'd been killed. <laughs> Don't die for a minute. Uh, you ought to be more careful with your flash guns, Mac. I thought Gavreau would come out shooting. Which reminds me, that's the one thing he hasn't got in this trunk, a gun. All right. I guess he just figured it was a foolproof scheme and he wouldn't need one. He had just about everything figured by that. <laughs> Gavreau and the boy are held on charges of attempted burglary. When the day arrives for the trial. The case of George Gavreau and Ed Silver versus the state. Are the defendants present? Gavreau is here, Your Honor, but I don't see the other defendant, Mr. Silver. Uh, perhaps Mr. Uh, Harris knows. He's supposed to be here, Your Honor. If the court pleases to take a short recess, I'll go over to the jail and see what's detaining him. We will take a short recess. <laughs> Across the bridge of size goes Nick Harris to the old county jail, scrutinizing the prisoners he passes, looking for the strangely absent Silver. A turnkey leads the detective to Silver's cell, where the boy is lying on his cot. Silver. Silver. Get up. He was supposed to be in court a half hour ago. Better open the cell, turnkey. Looks like he's trying to pull a fast one. Yes, sir. Come on, Silver. 
There's no use trying to get out of this. He's got to move. Turn him over. Poor kid. Couldn't stand the gas. Looks like it was heart trouble. Well, he's better off this way, I guess. Just goes to show, Turnkey, that there's no way you can beat the law and win. So Ed Silver beat the rap by the surest way, death. Javro, so-called mastermind burglar, was sentenced to the maximum term prescribed by law for the crime of attempted burglary, and after serving his sentence was deported from this country as an undesirable alien. And so ends the story of one of the most ingenious plots I have ever run into. Had it not been for that mysterious letter, Gavro might have been able to carry out his scheme and even now be living off the thousands of dollars of loot. But fortunately for a great many people, such was not the case. And as the result of our discovery, trunks left in storage are thoroughly inspected before being allowed to be placed in the warehouse or bank vault. Thus, my advice to anyone who might wish to try this scheme is, it might have worked once, but it won't work now. You can't come in.